Anyway, so that's sort of like the low light of my weekend. The highlight of my weekend was going to uh, watch my son run in um, CIF uh, prelims for track this weekend. Uh, my son Josh, my middle son, who's 17, he was first in his league for the 800 meters, and so he went on to run in uh, county prelims this weekend, and it was so fun to, to watch him run. I was so proud of him. He took, he took a full six seconds off of his best time from before then, so that was, that was super exciting. Their league is actually not that competitive, so he's kind of used to winning in his league, so this, the, the county prelims was an opportunity to run against some really fast people and to really challenge themselves, and the, the team just did an amazing job. Uh, I was so proud of my son, and I was proud of just his teammates. Uh, a couple of the other ones just had amazing PRs, and they just, they were fabulous. So I'm having just a really, just a really fun weekend. We actually had the, the night after the track meet, we took the kids all out to dinner, and just, we had kind of a, a celebrating Josh night. And it was so fun just as a mom thinking about all the things that he's done this year. This is his junior year of high school. And you're just going to have to excuse me. I know I'm just, I know I'm just having like a, a crazy mom bragging moment, but I have the microphone. And so you're just going to have to deal with that for a minute. But, you know, he, he's worked so hard to, to get his grades up this year. And he's had you know, just really, really improved his grades. He worked really hard to improve his SATs, took them a second time and just really rocked it the second time. I was so proud of him. And then we just got back a couple weeks ago from, from his school where they did a school exhibition on what they had been, had been working on. And there was a, a documentary film that he and a partner had made that was, it looked almost professional quality to me most of the way through. And I just felt so, I just felt so, so proud of him and really proud of all of my, my kids. Um, but you know, one thing that I thought about a lot as I was kind of going away, just feeling like a proud mom and boasting about my, my kids in front of people who have to listen to me because I have the microphone, is um, I thought a lot about how much of the things that, you know, those of us who are parents feel proud of as parents or the things that we feel proud of in our own lives, how many of those things do we, can we really take credit for? How much should I really be proud of my kids and how much maybe should I just be grateful? Um, you know, it's, I feel proud watching him race and seeing him win and seeing him improve his times and do really well. And yet, you know, I realize all of my, all my kids are runners. They're, they're gifted that way. Um, I'm not gifted that way, so I can't even keep up with our 13-year-old. I'm, I'm here the, the decrepit lady who tried to do too many squats and can barely walk. But, you know, but my kids are gifted. You know, it's a gift that they're, it's, it's part of what they're born with. They're good runners, right? And it's not, it's not something they've done. It's something they received. And then I get all excited when they do well in school and I'm proud of them because, you know, because they're smart. But wait, you know, it doesn't really make sense to be proud of them because they're smart, right? That's not something they've done. It's something that they've received. I think in our culture, we really value intelligence a lot. We really value it, and we do kind of respect people who seem intelligent, and yet, is respect really due to somebody who seems really intelligent? Because it's not, it's not something they've done. It's just something that they are born with, right? And I think, too, in our culture, we really value a lot physical attractiveness, don't we? We feel good about ourselves if we look good. We don't feel so good if we don't look good. And yet, you know, is that something to be proud of or to feel good or bad about? It's just, it's, it's who we are and it's what we've received. And so how much of the things that we might feel proud of really have anything to do with us? Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and he's talking about the gospel, but I think it applies to a lot more than just the gospel. What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? I think it's a really good question for us to think about. What do we have that we haven't, in some form or another, just been given? And if we don't have things that, haven't, that we haven't received, that haven't been given to us, then 
Why would we act like we have some responsibility for the blessings that we have? I want us to think about this for a minute. What do we have that we didn't receive? Try to think of something. What's one thing in your life that you have that nobody else gave you in any way, shape, or form? One thing in your life that no one else had a hand in, that originated entirely from you. I can't really think of one. You know, did any of us have a hand in our own birth? <laughs> did any of us have a hand in our own conception? You know, we, don't, we don't have anything to do even with the fact that we're here. We, we did nothing to cause our arrival on the earth. And We've done nothing to facilitate the genetic makeup that we received when we were conceived. We've simply arrived as the people that we are, and we had no hand in it. And then, what about our lives? What about our stuff? Like, what about my house, and my car, and my TV, and the things that I have? Surely, I, I earned those things, right? I went out, and I worked, and I earned the money, and I bought those things, and so those things are are from me, right? But I think sometimes we have sort of historical and geographic amnesia. Um, you know, we think in our heads, okay, I worked really hard so that I could have enough money to buy this car. And we think in our heads, I studied. Do you know how many years I went to school so I could get this job, so I could work really hard so I could buy this car? Do you know how much I've invested to have the grades that I've been producing if I'm a student? Um, and yet, again, I think historical and geographic amnesia. How much of the fact that we have the things that we have has to do with how incredibly hard we worked for them, and how much of it has to do with the fact that we have been born into a period in history of unprecedented op economic opportunity? Things that the world has, has never seen before. How much of it has to do even with just being born into a place in present time where there's amazing opportunity? It's not really so much all of the hard work as it is just having had the privilege of being born into incredible opportunities. Um, just for contrast, you could theoretically have been born in Egypt, say, in the year... 2600 BC, and you probably would have been a slave if you had been born in Egypt in the year 2600 BC. And you could have worked really, really, really hard all of your life as a rock dragger for the pyramid building, as a slave, all of your incredibly short life. <laughs> you could have busted your butt and worked really, really hard, and you would have never become anything other than a, a rock pusher for your whole life. Uh, just a few more um, you know, historic careers for comparison to what's available to us today. I was thinking about tanners, because there's a guy named Simon in the Bible who's a tanner. A tanner is a person who prepares leather for for use for all kinds of products. And I, I like leather, so I mean, tanner seems like a pretty good job. I like leather belts and leather jackets, and you know, it feels nice and it smells nice. Leather's pretty cool. Well, I was reading up about the job of a tanner, and it's, it's really disgusting. Um, because it's, it doesn't smell so nice and feel so nice and stuff until it's all actually processed. So this guy in the Bible, Simon, who was a tanner, do you know how this actually worked? I looked this up this week. So the skins would arrive, you know, with the, with the usable meat cut off, but not necessarily everything that's not usable cut off. And it would just be sort of bloody and gross and full of like, you know, bits of animal that were still on there. And so you'd get them and they'd just be nasty and and gross and covered with blood and gore and stuff like that. And you'd have to scrape off all of the, you know, whatever's left on the inside of the skin. But then after you scraped off all of the gunk, you still have to get the hair off. You have to get the animal hair off before you can use the leather. So do you know how they got the hair off? There were a couple different ways that you could process it. One was just to leave it to putrefy for like a really long time. Just let it sit there and like rot until it was utterly disgusting and then the hair would eventually fall off. So that smells good. 
And then the other option was to soak it in urine. So you'd just put out buckets and collect urine from all the people in the town, and then you'd soak the, the animal hide in urine until the hair was ready to come off. And then it gets grosser than that. It's, this is not even close to the end. So then, then after that, you have to make it get soft, right? So you know, what chemicals did you use to make it soft? Well, you had a couple options there too. Animal brains work pretty well for that. And the other thing that works really well for that is dung. So basically what you would do is you would fill a vat with some water and some animal poo, and then you would put the skin in there and then you would knead it in the poo for like two or three hours and then rinse it out. And that's how you would make it soft. It's like, so think, you know, you could have been born in like Bible times and been a tanner. And that would be an excellent career. You could work really hard at that. You would smell fantastic. People would want you to live outside of town and work outside of town so they didn't have to be near you. Uh, just for fun, a couple other sort of historic careers that you could have. Um, you know, say you wanted to go to sort of medieval Europe or something like that. Like, let's go back to just a time when they used to use leeches medicinally. If you were really poor and really desperate, you could be a leech collector. And if you were a leech collector, you just, you just find a body of water that you know to be infested with leeches, and then you just kind of cruise back and forth in it for a little while until you've got a bunch of leeches stuck on you, and then you take them, and you go back to like, the doctors that need the leeches, and you yank them off, and it's all, you've got bloody sores all over, and you sell the leeches. And so that's a good career. Last one, last one, and I'm going to stop grossing you guys out, but this was the you know, last possible historic career that you could have. Um, Gong farmer. Anybody know what a gong farmer was? So a gong farmer is sort of like, I've, I've often looked at the trucks that come and clean out the porta potties, and, and I've thought, you know, that would be a bad job. I do not think I would want to be one of those people who cleans out porta potties. You get the, the truck and you put the little hose in there and you suck all the stuff out and then you take the truck to the dump. Well, the gong farmer had that job before there was the fancy truck and the fancy hose. So the gong farmer's job was just to go to the pit where everybody went to the toilet and then you know, scoop all the stuff out in the middle of the night and take it away and use it to fertilize something somewhere. So just think, you know, hey, if I had born into, been born into a different family in a different place in a different time, I could have been a gong farmer. And that would have been fun. Um, so I've kind of gone off a little bit and that's a little bit gross. But going back to the main point, um, can we really take credit for anything that we have? You know, is it really because of us and things that we've done that we, that we have the lives that we have, that we have the things that we have, that we have the opportunities that we have? In the end, almost nothing that we had, nothing that we have is originated from us. It's all simply things that we have received. We don't really get to decide what we're going to receive. We just receive them. We do get to decide, however, what we're going to do with the things that we've received. And so we're going to talk about that today. What, what are we going to do with the things that we have received? We're in a series right now that we're calling Vineyard Core, and actually that we ripped off from Columbus Vineyard. Jamie and I had listened to some messages in a series that they did called Vineyard Core, and we thought, hey, we really like this. We want to bring this back to coast and share a lot of these same things. So a lot of what you're going to hear this morning is actually copied from Columbus Vineyard's uh, young adult pastor, uh, Jonathan Root, on a, a message that he gave on this topic. And, and in Vineyard Core, we're just talking about basics of what it means for us to be followers of Jesus together, and specifically, what does it mean for us uh, you know, at Coast Vineyard to be followers of Jesus together? And so that's why we're calling it that. And this week's message is called Growing Our Gifts. And we're gonna talk about how it is that we respond to the things that we've been given. We're gonna be looking at a parable that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 25. So if you have a Bible, you can check out Matthew chapter 25. I'm actually not gonna put all the words up this time because it's, we're gonna read a pretty long section, so I'm not gonna put them all up on the screen. So you can, if you wanna follow along, have, have your own Bible. There are a few on that, on the, in the back corner over there, so you can grab one if you want one. You're welcome to take those home if you need one. Um, and we're going to start just a minute in Matthew 25, but before we do that, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just welcome your presence. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for all of the gifts that you've given us. We're just incredibly grateful for the blessings that you've poured out on us. 
And God, I ask that you would show us from your word how you want us to respond to the blessings that we've received. Let me pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Matthew 25, starting in verse 14, Jesus, speaking of the kingdom of God, says, It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability, and then he went on his journey. So the man is getting ready to go away, and he takes all of his money, and he gives it to his servants. Um, now, when we think about this, we can think about the man going away as being like God, and we can think about the servants as being like us. Yesterday, they didn't have much. Now, all of a sudden, today, they have all this money. It's not, it's not something that originated from them. It's something that they received. And just as we've been talking about um, already, everything that we have, we have received. The man or God goes away and gives, the, and gives his servants uh, the money. So everything we have, we have received. And then whose is it? Who does the money belong to? Does God say, I'm giving you this money as a gift. It is now yours. No, the man, it says, the man entrusted his wealth to them. When, when it says entrusted it to them, he's giving them responsibility for it. He's not giving it to them so that they own it. He's giving it to them so that they can take care of it. He entrusted it to them so they could care for it. And so not only is everything we have something that we have received, but also what we have received does not belong to us. It's kind of like God gave us some money and told us to look after it and gave us you know, power of attorney so that we could make decisions related to it, but we're taking care of it for him. Um, it's not actually ours. We've been given responsibility for somebody else's wealth. Um, just thinking about the world for a minute, hypothetically, um, if there is a God, and I think most of us are here because we think there is, but you know, let's just say, for those of us who maybe are checking things out, if there is a God, then probably we can assume that he made everything and that he's the one who keeps everything going. And assuming again that there is a God, if he made everything and he's keeping everything going, then everything in the world really ultimately belongs to him. Does that seem like reasonable logic? So if there's a God, he made everything, everything belongs to him. And again, I think for, for purposes of this room, I think we can be pretty comfortable assuming that there is a God and indeed he made everything and it does belong to him. And so whatever it is that we have received is not really ours. It's actually something that belongs to him, which has been entrusted to us. One way we could think about this is John Murphy, for many, many years, has been the administrator and bookkeeper for Coast Vineyard. That means that all of the money that we have together as a church, that, that all of us have given for whatever we're going to do as a church community, he has responsibility for. He keeps track of everything that comes in, and he keeps track of everything that goes out, he pays all of the bills, writes all of the, of the checks, and basically maintains and is responsible for, for all of the money. The board makes decisions about how that happens, and he's the one who executes it. Um, and he's done a fantastic job. He's getting ready to retire, and we're bringing on Jamie Reichling, who's going to be our, our new administrator, our new bookkeeper, and she's going to be responsible for those things. So, now, what if we gave her this job of managing our church's uh, collected money for the purposes of the church, and we checked back in with her in about a month. We said, hey, Jamie, so how's it going? What do you think about the new job? How's it working out for you? And she said, oh, I love being responsible for Coast Vineyard's money. This is like the best job ever. First thing I did was I went out and I got myself a new car. I love my new car. And then I took my family on vacation, and I think we're going to remodel our house. And, you know, if that was the report that we got back a month after she'd been in charge, we'd be thinking, oh my gosh. And this would, I mean, it would never happen, right? But, but she would have completely missed the point. This is not what you do when you're given charge, when you're given responsibility, when money has been entrusted to you that belongs to somebody else. You don't just go out and spend it all on 
you. And so again, the things that we have, our stuff, our money, our belongings, our lives, our talents, everything that we have and everything that we do, it's, it's not ours. It belongs to God. And so we need to treat it differently than we would treat it if it belonged to us. And I, I want to go so far as to say you know, it's, it's not really just even our things. It really is us. It's our lives and our bodies, ultimately, that belong to God. Just another quote from Paul from 1 Corinthians. This is in chapter 6. He says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, Paul, in this case, is particularly talking about sexual integrity. He's telling people, hey, your body doesn't belong to you. You need to treat it respectfully. You can't just go out and use it however you want to. But I think that applies actually beyond sexual integrity issues. I think it applies on a, on a large scale. I mean, what if we really thought about our bodies as being something that belonged to God, which we are entrusted with? That really changes the way that I think about myself. I think in some ways it, all, it changes my self-esteem kind of a lot because I think it makes me feel better about who I am. But beyond that, I think it's a, it's a really big responsibility. I mean, what if you genuinely thought of yourself as having somebody else's body on loan? I mean, there's a lot of things that that would change. I mean, I certainly wouldn't go out and sleep around if I thought I had somebody else's body on loan. But not only would I not go out and sleep around, I'd probably eat better. I would definitely want to be eating nutritiously, and I probably would exercise, you know, maybe more or at least more responsibly. I would try not to do, you know, the, the ill-advised sand soccer game that broke my foot if I, was, if I had somebody else's body on loan, right? I mean, we, I, how would we treat our, even our physical being if we really thought about it as belonging to God? And how do we treat all of the pieces of our lives and who we are if we really think about them as ultimately belonging to God? And we're going to go on in the passage. We're going to see what does God expect us to do with his stuff? When he, gives us, when he entrusts us with things, what are his expectations? So we're going to keep on reading the parable. Here's what Jesus says next. The man who had received five bags of gold went out at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, You entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, saying the same thing, exactly. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would receive it back with interest. So very different response to the person who simply just gave him his money back without having changed anything than to the other two. So what did the man expect his servants to do with his money? What were his expectations? Somebody just, somebody shout out what you think. What, what, what did the man expect his servants to do with the money? Put it to work? Put it to work? Make, more money. Make more money? Yeah, he expected them to multiply it, didn't he? He expected them to use the money to make it grow, to, to multiply his investment. 
can think of, this, of the man as being an investor. He expected his money to be put to use in such a way as it would be multiplied. And it's the same way with the things that God has given to us. When God entrusts us with money, with stuff, with gifts and talents, with relationships, with, with ourselves, our beings, our bodies, with everything that we have, his expectation is that, that we'll multiply it. Our gifts are meant to be multiplied. And I think sometimes that's pretty challenging. I can really relate to the guy who dug a hole and hid the money in there because I feel like, I feel like particularly with money, I, I'm having a hard time just not spending it. It's hard enough for me just to not waste my money. So I, I think I feel really successful just if I manage to not overspend. Like, Look, your money is still here. I didn't lose it. I didn't spend it on something. I didn't like tell myself I was borrowing it and I would have time to put it back before you got home and then not have it anymore when you got here. It's, it's still here. I succeeded in not spending it. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, I would feel pretty successful. I, I feel really successful every time I just don't overspend. As long as I don't spend money I don't have, I feel pretty good. Um, so it, it seems like this might be a, a reasonable amount of success. I mean, even if we don't even talk about money, just I think about food. Like, our family tries so hard not to waste food, but we waste so much food. So much of what we buy goes into our refrigerator and gets forgotten about and then rots and has to be thrown away. And I keep thinking, gosh, we could save so much money if we just ate everything that we bought. What if we just ate all the food that we bought and we never threw anything away? So I try, but it, it doesn't work out very well. I found, when, earlier this year, I found a container of sour cream in the back of my refrigerator where I, I pulled it out and I opened it up thinking, oh, I didn't remember we had sour cream. And I opened up the container and it was, it was rainbow colored. It was like every color, red and blue and green and orange, and it was so pretty that I took a picture of it and I posted it on Facebook. And um, all of you guys are going out to restaurants and taking pictures of your really nice, attractive, gorgeous meals and posting those on Facebook, which is weird. But you know, I suppose it's even weirder to post, you know, look at the nasty thing I found in the back of my refrigerator and post that on, on Facebook. But I was amazed that we had grown this thing in our own refrigerator. I don't know if any of you guys can relate to that. But, um, you know, but sometimes it's really, it's hard enough not just to waste things, isn't it? And yet God's expectations are not that we would just manage to keep what we have without wasting it or losing it. Uh, I think a, a good example of this, when I was a college student, my parents would keep track of how much money I made in the little jobs that I had. I had a few little odd jobs. I didn't really work full time during the school year. I worked for a summer, or I worked for a Christmas holiday, and. One summer, I, I got a job, and at the end of the summer, I had amassed a grand total of $600, and I felt really proud of myself. I earned $600, um, and I spent my $600 on a stereo. But what my mom did <laughs> was match my $600 and, and put it in a retirement account for me. Now, I was a college student at that time, and I wasn't really paying much attention to that. You know, she had said, here, sign this. I'm like, okay. So I sign it, and, and I wasn't paying a lot of attention because I was busy thinking about my life now. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, parents who think about things like what your life is going to be like later when you retire. I couldn't even imagine retiring at that point. So I mean, I wasn't thinking about it at all. But when I looked back, you know, decades later as an adult at the, the accounts that she started and looking in there like, well, that's not $600. That's thousands of dollars. Where did this money come from? So, well, it turns out my parents are pretty smart. You know, I didn't really know that before. They're getting smarter all the time. I feel like every year my parents get smarter and smarter. It's amazing how they're growing. Um, but but it, you know, it had multiplied many times over while I was just doing my own thing, not paying any attention to it because, because my my mom picked out a fund and invested this money and, and, and let it sit there and grow. And I think, hey, you know, if, if God or if a person, say, say somebody, a scenario like in this parable, somebody gives me their money and asks me to take care of it while they're gone. 
Say I have a friend who's going to be gone for 10 or 20 years. And they, they give me their money. And they say, hey, can you take care of this for me while I'm gone? And then, you know, what would I do? I've got a couple of options. I mean, I could, I could go old school and I could cut a hole in my mattress and I could stuff all the cash inside my mattress and just leave it there and hope that it would still be there when they got home. Um, that would be kind of the old school way to do it. And of course, it would actually be worth less by the time they got home. With inflation, it would not be worth nearly as much as it was when I stuffed it there. Or I think I'd probably do like my parents. I mean, if I really wanted to be a good friend to the person whose money I was babysitting, then I'd be looking into a place to invest it. Not something risky. I wouldn't pick something that's high risk where there'd be a good chance that they'd lose all their money. <laughs> But I wouldn't stuff it into my mattress either. I'd be, looking for a, I'd be looking for a balanced, diversified, relatively safe, but growing fund where I could put their money so that when they came home, it would have grown. Um, so what does that mean for the things that God has given us? What about the, the skills and the gifts that we've been given? What about the money that we've been given? What about the material things that we've been given, our relationships, um, ourselves, the gospel message that's in us. It's, it's meant to be multiplied. Um, and how do, how do we do that? How do we multiply the things that God has given to us? I think going back to, the, to money for a minute, and I think money in this story is a euphemism really for everything that has been entrusted to us. But sometimes when we think about how money is a euphemism for everything else, then we kind of want to skip the money part because the money is the part we really don't like to talk about and it's kind of the part we don't really like to share. And so that makes us a little bit uncomfortable. But I think, I think probably money gets used as an example partly because it's a really good way to illustrate the idea of something being multiplied and then also partly because God really does want us to think about our money. And so using that as the particular example is helpful because then we can't, we can't really dodge it. But but. Does God want us to just multiply our money? So God has given us money, and his goal is for us to amass more and more. So if we're going to be like these people, okay, I'm going to be like the people in the story. I'm going to use the money that God has given me so I can have more and more money. And then once I've got more and more money, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy myself an awesome car, and I'm going to buy myself an awesome house, and I'm going to go on vacation, and I'm going to spend all of this money um, on me. Um, is, that, is that the plan? Um, we're going to keep reading. We're going to read what Jesus says next. A note is whenever you read things that Jesus says, don't just stop when you get to the end of the story. A lot of times if you stop when you get to the end of the story, you never find out what he's really talking about. A lot of times at the end of the story, he explains what it was that he meant when he was telling a story. So always when reading the New Testament, read, if you read something that Jesus says and you're not really sure how it applies, read what he says next, because a lot of times what he says next is really, really important. So at the end of the parable, Jesus goes on to say this, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? 
He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And so right after Jesus tells this parable, he tells another story, a true story, about God's expectations for how it is that we multiply the things that are given to us. When we multiply the things that are given to us, it's not just a matter of amassing more and more, but it's a matter of using what it is that we've been given to bless other people. And that's the manner in which he expects us to grow the things that he has given to us. And so gifts, uh, let me see if I can get this up here. There we go. Gifts are meant to bless others. Um, when Jesus asks us, what did you do with the things that I have given you? And did you, what he means is, did you use the things that I've given you to bless other people? I think usually when I think about somebody being greedy, I think about an incredibly wealthy person who has tons of resources, lives in a giant mansion, and has their own private jet, and I think of those people as being greedy. But I recently heard um, uh, from, from this young adult pastor at Columbus Vineyard a different definition of greed, which I really like. And the definition of greed that he uses is this. Um, using everything that you have for yourself. What if we took that as our definition of greed? Using everything that you have for yourself. And then it would be truly the opposite of generosity, which is what we're called to as followers of Jesus, using the things that we have in order to bless other people. Um, the Bible tells us that each of us has been given gifts and that the gifts that we've given are for the building up of the church. And I would say beyond the building up of the church, they're for the blessing of the world that's around us. Um, what do you have? And let's just think about this for a minute. What do you have that you could teach to other people? You could multiply by sharing gifts or skills with others. Um, what do you have that you could give away to other people? What do you have that even if you aren't going to give it away, you can share with others? Um, what are some ways that you can serve people around you? What are the things that we have received? If we have received money, how can we multiply our money in such a way that it blesses many more people besides us? If we've received love, how can we share that love so it blesses many other people besides us? If we've received a home, maybe we use that home as a base for hospitality to share love with other people. Um, if we've received wisdom, how do we share the wisdom that comes from our experience? with other people. We have a lot of skills in this room, just all kinds of different skills. Some of us have computer skills. Some of us have great relationship skills. Some of us have wisdom about economics. We, there's all kinds of different skill sets in this room. How can those skill sets be used to bless people around us? You know, just going back to the very beginning when I was thinking about my, my son and feeling just so proud of the, his accomplishments in the, in the last year. Um, you know, a person to me that's a really good example of what it looks like to multiply our gifts actually is, is his coach. The, his name is, is Mike Strong. He's a teacher and a coach. He's been a coach to all three of my children. And, um, and coaching has never really just been about running for him. It's, it's been about the kids and investing in their lives and spending time with them. And all three of my kids have learn not just to believe that they could succeed at athletics, but the, to believe in themselves, to believe they could su succeed at life. Um, just the investment of time and love that's been poured into so many teenagers over so many years. And that's what it looks like to multiply a gift. I mean, here's a, here's a guy who loves to run. And who would have thought that loving to run <laughs> could be a gift, could be multiplied so many times over and bless so many people. Uh, my oldest son, Daniel, is, is going to school right now after, he's going to college right now after having had Mike as his coach for many, many years. And he's studying to be a teacher. And he's been telling me, you know, I want to be, I want to be a humanities teacher and I want to be a coach. And I thought, wow. This is a gift multiplied. 
when you invest in the lives of young kids so much that they want to grow up and be like you because they want to invest in the lives of other young kids when they grow up just like you did. That's, that's how gifts get multiplied. This is a person that I just amazingly admire. And then, you know, when I think about my kids and I feel proud, thinking, ah, well, you know, I feel grateful for the bodies they've been given. I feel grateful for the minds that they've been given. I feel grateful for the lifestyle that we've been able to receive. And I, but I feel proud of them when they multiply those gifts, when they invest in growing those gifts. And when I feel really, really, really proud is when they learn how to invest in multiplying those gifts in such a way that it blesses the, the people around them. Um, I want to end with a, a confession. And uh, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to end with a confession and with um, just a little exercise that we're going to do before we go this morning. And, and this is the confession. Um, I'm not my own. I'm a steward of what belongs to God. My goal is to give back more than what has been given to me. What do you guys think about that? Does that sound like something you feel comfortable with? I'm not my own. I'm a steward of what belongs to God. My goal is to give back more than what has been given to me. Does that make sense? And if it does, let's just, let's just try saying that together. Let's just affirm that this is what God has spoken into our lives. Can you guys say that with me? I am not my own. I am a steward of what belongs to God. My goal is to give back more than what has been given to me. And here's a little exercise that I want us to do before we go. And that's, there's, you got in your bulletin uh, a set of 10 blanks. And it says, what gifts have I received? I want you to just take a minute and write down as many gifts you've received as you can think of. Maybe you will come up with five. Maybe you will come up with 10. We're only going to do this for about like 60 seconds or so. So you won't be able to, to list every single thing you've ever received. But, st but get started. Start to make a list. Write down the things you can think of that you have received. Your stuff, your money, your 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 gifts, your talents, your skills, your relationships. What are all of the, what are the things you can think of that you have received as gifts in your life? Um, and I'm just going to pause for a minute. Actually, I think the worship band is going to come up and are they, yeah, if you guys can come on up. Yeah. I'm just going to pause for a minute and let people go ahead and write. See if you can get 10. If you can't, you can work on some more later. Um, yeah. And then one more thing I would like us to do before we go is just pick, just pick one of those. Any one of those gifts that you wrote down that you want to start trying to multiply in a way that blesses other people. Um, I mean, ideally, we, we multiply all of our gifts and we use the, all of them to bless other people. But when we set goals for ourselves, it's nice to set you know little simple goals. So then just pick one. And you don't necessarily have to pick the hardest one. Pick the one that sounds like fun. Pick the one that sounds the easiest. What's one thing on that list that you could multiply and that you could use to bless the other people around you? Yeah. And then let's stand. We're going to end in worship. Yeah. Lord, we just ask that you, um, Lord, you empower us to use the resources that you've given us um, to bless people around us. Lord, would you... God, would you help us? Would you show us how? And would you empower us? Would you make us a blessing to many? Thank you for what you've given to us. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, Coast. 
Uh, my name's Amy. I'm my husband and I run the prayer ministry here. So I want to just lead us in a little bit of time together to pray. Um, as I was thinking about what God was doing, I was kind of coming up with a loss, but ended kind of on thinking like it kind of terrifies me in a little bit of ways to fully think about giving my life to the Lord and what that would look like and feeling like I'm not my own and Brian's not really mine which is really hard to say. But I mean, but that's part of the reality. So I think part of giving up our lives is working through that fear and being able to trust God through that fear. So if that's you at all this morning, or if you're just curious and like, God, I want to do this, but I don't know how, then I would love to welcome you guys to come up. So can I have the prayer team come up so we are available to pray? And if we don't have a lot of prayer team members, then can any home group leaders who lead other ministries at Coast come up and pray with me. Cool. Awesome. So if any of those things resonate with you or if you just have something completely different that you want prayer for this morning, then come up, get ministered to, let God speak into your life. Um, but we're going to close together as a community. So if we could hold hands across the aisles together, I will go ahead and close us. So God, thank you, Lord, for this morning. Lord, thank you that you are trustworthy and faithful and good. And God, that you are all those things so that we can give ourselves up to you, Lord. And I ask, Father, that this week would be a start of something different for all of us here at Coast, God, that we would find one way, Lord, with each other, with the people around us, God, to offer ourselves to you whether that be a helping hand to someone, whether that be donating money, whether that be giving up our time or our skills, God. I ask, Lord, that you would start our journeys of that today and really pull it through into fruition this week, God. So I pray blessing over us as a community. Pray courage over us as a community to step out and start to be different for the sake of you, Lord. So thank you, Father, for what you've provided. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.